Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, here to the Snap Judgments League. For those who do not know, my name is Guest. I am your host for casting these amazing matches here at the Snap Judgments League. We are now in season two in week number two, and we are going to be going in and showcasing some of the uh, competition battles that are happening right now in competitive Marvel Snap. These recordings, as always, have been happening throughout the week. I have not seen anything whatsoever, but we haven't had any OTAs or major changes, so all the cards should be up to date. Everything that we're seeing, we're experiencing here live on twitch.tv backslash It's Guest Gaming. Uh, together, we're all going to find out together how some of these matches actually went. So if you're ready for it, I'm ready for it. If you like this type of content, hit that like and subscribe button down below. And let's go take a look at our very first match of the day. As we start with JJ Rolk going on in first and foremost. What the hell is this? JJ. With the bad idea, covering everything just to screw with me the entire time here on the stream with a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of things, all of the sponsorship things, all of the randoms. You know what? And, oh, look at the, oh, look at this. JJ. Oh, look at look at JJ. See, this is what happens when you ask when you ask for lots of things to happen and you don't want them to happen, this is what he does. So, you know what? You know what, JJ? We're gonna leave it. We're gonna leave it because you're doing this just because you're amazingly annoying. You're looking for me to say that while you play down Mysterio and Ant-Man, right? You're looking for me to say, I'm not gonna showcase this anymore, even though I've asked you and all of our comp competitors, they look to send on over uh, gameplay that's clean, that allows us to take a look at what's going on on the board, and remove a bunch of the things on the stream. So you, my viewers, and our viewers here at the Snap Judgment League, have a clean and amazing experience. So that's what we're being provided with here, which is the good idea. To put in the good idea of this is how we're gonna experience the Snap Judgments League of JJ Rolf versus Allow Dark. So JJ, you got me. Congratulations, I hate you. This was your last time here on the Snap Judgments League. <laughs> I can't even say it with a straight face. Well done, good sir. We have a Patriot Mysterio. Probably, I'm assuming we're going to end up seeing a Mockingbird style of deck simultaneously. Maybe something along those lines. That's my assumption as we get Jubilee to pull out the death. Jubilee, Titania, Ravona, Hobgoblin, Blink. I like this style of pixie build here. We were talking recently on the channel here about Titania. I'm not going to lie. Uh, Titania has a lot of synergies with some of the upcoming cards as well. You should go ahead and take a look at some of the other other videos on this channel that are featuring Nomura, and you'll see exactly what we're talking about. So Blink with Leech is looking to be a good idea. It's very strong here in the current meta, so how can we utilize that to our advantage? Even though it looks like he's trying to set up a Galactus lane, because of Thunderbolt's tower. I don't know if it's still gonna be strong enough yet for him to say this is worth a snap uh, without Galactus in hand, but he thinks so. He thinks that this is okay. Fire it on over, it's gonna get the negative two, right? So if the negative two comes on over, it's gonna drop down in total to a negative 11 in that lane. If he can top deck, y'all, if he can top deck that Galactus, that lane is done. Put down the Ravona. here's a nice man for the blink. No, he pulls the Mobius. So he's got a good lead, right? But Ant-Man's about to go up. You're gonna get the lane filler. So that's gonna add plus four. So literally any two cost card would do it. But Allow Dark is too scared. Too scared. You're down on that negative 12 and for four cubes, it's not worth finding out with priority if Rolk actually has the Galactus in hand. So he takes away and with a great, great snap is able to steal two cubes out of Allow Dark. Here's Pet Mansion as, can we acknowledge the Pixel Galactus choice here? Wow, that's, and it's, and it's whew, gold with purple crackle too. Like if you're gonna get Galactus, that's probably the way you wanna feel. 
just straight up chaos. And I'm all about it, actually. That's well done. Well done, good sir. As we get Sunspot and Ant-Man to reinforce us first, getting the extra bonus on the Lake Hellas as a couple of raptors appear over in the Savage Land in the right-hand side. Nice start here with the Ravona down into the Goblin, looking to get down two Goblins in those lanes, even on crazy amounts of floats. This looks to be a pretty strong setup as the Green Goblin lands in Pet Mansion, helping to offset a bit of the Iceman Sunspot bit. Now, it is a little risky to plop the Hobgoblin into Pet Mansion, but at the same time, it's very unlikely that Allow Dark is going to clog up his own lane on turn four. So I am a fan of taking that chance here. Because even still, you'd be able to play out it. And he actually does. He backs the Hobgoblin into the Pet Mansion, leaves it. We see a snap. Tough position for JJ Rolk, who's sitting on that Jubilee Pixie death, looking at any other Sixer that could have been flipped out. But the uh, no blinking hand on a failed Goblin means that there is no rotation. There's nothing to destroy here. This is a tough position for JJ right now, who wants to try to counteract that lane, but there's nothing nothing that's going to be able to do that. All right, that's fair. That's fine. Nice, nice play there from Allow Dark, understanding the double goblin situation and looking to prevent that hobgoblin from landing on in. Very well played. Not very likely that you're going to clog a lane on turn four, but knowing your opponent's deck that early on, seeing the play line ahead of time with the potential to grow because of the sunspot. Very well done. Very well done. JJ doesn't think so, but allow dark does. JJ holding on to a 9-8 lead as Ant-Man has dropped into the big house. And just floatings right now for JJ. Nothing to drop. Potentially a Mobius on the next turn, safely into the big house, maybe into location number three. As we get a bunch of squirrels spreading across the board, Icebox adds plus one to the Hobgoblin in JJ's hand. So now sitting at a six negative eight, not feeling like a very good card at the moment as the Patriot drops also into the mid by the Ant-Man and the original Squirrel Girl disappears. Galactus makes an appearance as Mobius undoes the effects of the Icebox and brings the Hobgoblin back to a five cost. I like this play from JJ with the Titania looking to send it over and clog the big house here on turn four, because even if they play into it, that's completely fine. Titania ends up staying on this side either way. So I like the fire off here, controlling that lane. Iceman drops on down, makes no effect on the on the board due to Mobius and the Titania holds Ant-Man in place who will lose his buff as Titania gets sent back. JJ's got to be eyeing for a small drop to send that Titania back over and really needs to hope on the landing of the Hobgoblin here in the right, which is already rocking two cards. They play nothing into that side. The Kazar drops down, sends over the Hobgoblin into the icebox, and now JJ has to decide what is more valuable. Is it to be sending back Titania to his own side to win the big house and try to win off somewhere else? Or is it to just straight up Galactus into the icebox and steal that lane? It's a very rough hand as he has Jubilee and Pixie. Jubilee can potentially pull Cannonball from what we saw in the prior hands. Pixie would be able to send the Titania back over, most likely securing that location. Because Allow Dark has priority here.
hoping that the Jubilee can pull enough into the icebox. It gives it a two point differential just based on the Jubilee, but the over the topness on either Blink, which would fire out a different card for the Wasp, because Pixie was played second. And we get a snap back, looking to push Allow Dark all the way in. Rolk likes his pull potential here, no matter what happens. And they go for eight as Ultron drops into the icebox, reinforcing Murder World, securing that location. Here comes the Jubilee who pulls out Cannonball, destroying the Ultron in the icebox, securing that location. Here comes the Pixie, drops on down, sends Titania back over, and that's an eight cube steal and win for JJ Trolling Rolk. Big eight cuber with the jubilee flip ladies and gentlemen and jj rolk comes on down with a huge win here in week number two absolutely fantastic play ggs all around but man you could not have predicted every possible scenario in that that cannonball was the mvp to make that moment work whether it be Jubilee into pulling out the cannonball or pulling out the blink, which would have maybe gotten the cannonball out because you already had the death in the hand. Great read and understanding the flexibility of your deck. Well played. It was a win-win in either scenario. So fantastic plays there. We'll be right back, folks, as we get ready for match number two. Welcome back. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to continue into match number two here as we showcase someone we haven't been able to showcase for quite some time here on the Snap Judgments League, and I'm very honored to be taking a look into this game. Let's swing the views over as we dive into Rauda versus Lafleur. It's just more fun to say that way. Let's go. Let's see what happens here. GG's. Good luck. Have fun. Let me know down in the chat. Who do you think is going to win this one? Go right ahead now. We start off with the discard of Debris and Haivo to open us up. Okay. Debris and Haivo is the starting combo. As Sokovia really throws some information aggressively out on the very first turns. As a Widow's Kiss appears into the third location, Lefleur notices that that Red Hulk is now sitting at 17 in the hand, and District X shuffles it all up with a snap right away to help secure at least that early lane. You've got a Red Hulk into one lane all by itself, even potentially that's going to feel great. The Green Goblin throwing on over. Lefleur says nothing is worth trying to find this out. Let's move on. Let's go give you the singular cube. It's a game of cube management, and let's go ahead and leave one down rather than two. So, feeling good. With a bar sinister and a green goblin and titania in hand. Huge opening combination wins to start us off. And then Oscorp Tower to boot. White Widow into Bar Sinister already on turn two is going to secure that lane and Lefleur definitely doesn't feel good. There's no way they can feel good about it. Secure the location right away. We don't know too much about the High Evo deck right now, except that it's exclusively that. You have armor, you have High Evo. We're going to maybe see some extra unique pieces come to boot too, but uh, I'm not feeling 100% confident in it. With a Morag on top of it for Brown. He's got to feel good. He pulls the top deck Jeff on turn three with Morag in the right, is able to snap right on it with a lane lead. And Lefleur says there's no reason to even try to compete with it. I understand. That's fine. Moving on. Going into round number three. I was a little surprised that Brown did not go for the snap earlier prior to playing the White Widow, looking to potentially really secure down that location with the easy potential giveaway, I assume, of, hey, I'm snapping on turn, you know, two with this in my hand. I'm going to do this. But instead, 
decides not to, secure the location, and then use his snap equity later on. Nebula sitting all by itself now with a daredevil. So we see our sunspot for the very first time from Lefleur. There's your armor as well, looking to try to compete for the raft and get that extra six cost card out early. The Martage doesn't feel good for the game plan that might have potentially been going on for the Green Goblin in that lane, but instead, Brown is able to capitalize on a double debris situation. So on the one end, it will secure that raft getting filled up and give that free six cost card to the floor. But on the other end, it also then allows Brauder to play into the fact that you've only got an armor and a sunspot in the raft. So I'll take advantage of the control as I have it. If they clog Muir Island now, I'd be shocked on turn four, but we've already been shocked before with a hobgoblin, hobgoblin play. So Cyclops comes on in, ties Muir Island as the Green Goblin successfully lands in Muir Island. And now Brauda has to figure out what he can do in Kamartage besides just destroy two cards using Cannonball in Kamartage. It's gonna open up with a leech on turn five, so Tough decision on what to do with the Doc Ock or Cannonball. Should you go for the Clog? Should you go for the Destroy? Play it on down, guarantee the lane win. But not even a consideration for Brauda as he plays into the line of Muir Island giving a ramp up to Jeff being more valuable as a four power floaty device. And the Ravona on top of it. We get a snap, and Brad accepts the snap. And he full one, two, leech goes up two times, doesn't matter, it's a bear 510, and the Cyclops hits the Jeff, undoing it. It received the bonus from the Weir Island and Cyclops had a 50-50 shot of landing on it. It lands on it successfully. And with that full ramp, Rather's trying to decide how he can get his Doc Ock to procure a win here. Because that Jeff going over is not gonna do it unless if we saw a miraculous full float out of nowhere. It's too risky, not worth it. The two cubes was worth it given the debris scenario. He played into it as best he can, but Cyclops in particular was definitely the downfall here in Muir Island, and they move to round number four, end of the low stack stakes on this game. With a white hot room opening up first and foremost. got a great combination in his hand with that Jeff Professor X cannonball, but once again, it always is only going to come down to do they leech on four. If they're able to pull that leech on four, which is just barely over a 50-50 shot every single game, having the Jeff into the Professor X into the cannonball definitely feels good. Ooh, and Murder World's going to undo the benefit of Nebula in the right as we get a double float and watch Nebula melt away and disappear, bringing uh, Rolk to 13 in the hand. Now spreading out the power between Daredevil and Titanium. So we'll get a little bit of information here, finally. So we have a secured Professor X no matter what. The question is where? Would you, where are you gonna guess your opponent plays a second card? Because I personally think it would have been two cards. We do get so, we get the Enchantress and Sunspot, which will allow a secure win in the ice box if they play it on down. 
that's also going to be a floatable location, as Enchantress would be sending a card back via Murder World. Yeah, looking at that cannonball into Murder World on six. To also send back the Titania. You gotta think of how many cards are probably gonna get played on this final turn, though. Help decide where Titania is going to land at the very end. We get a snap. As the Profex holds down the icebox. Enchantress sends the Titania back over to Lafleur's side. Because remember, one of the risks you run is potentially having that Titania be destroyed via Cannonball. And as a four cube risker, he's going to take it, assuming that there's just going to be a big card that drops here on turn six. Singular card would send the Titania over back to Browther, who would then Cannonball the big card rather than risking it between a 50-50 of Titania and Enchantress. And it's a perfect call. Here comes the Blink who's going to rotate in the She-Hulk. She-Hulk is going to get cannonballed, turn into a big ol' rock. So even with the swing over of Titania, oh, he keeps it. He keeps it by one. The Blink keeps it by one, giving a 12 to 11 advantage. That's a tough loss for four cubes for Browda. After not seeing it yet in this game. Four rounds and no blinking. Even though we knew of the leech. 12 to 11. Knowing Browda, he was kicking himself after that one. And we move right into it. Oh. Tight, tight call. Goblet into Clintar, I like it. Runs. All right, runs away. Here we go. Continue into the high stakes. Nothing too crazy. Nothing too crazy. Just some retreats. Just brow the saying, I'm going to win four in a row against you now. That's because that's what he has to do. He's down to his final two cubes here in the high stakes, which means it's all just four to one. Nebula versus Sunspot. White Widow sends over the kiss. Wakanda's going to keep everything protected. As Titania goes ahead and clogs the lane with Cyclops and Sunspot sitting in it. We have two dead locations to work with. One player rocking a Jeff. Leech destroys the Doc Ock Cannonball as Debris clogs up one lane. Looking at the Jeff float on five. The Debris I don't necessarily understand because now that prevents the Titania from potentially coming back to your side of the battlefield with the ramping of Cyclops, with the ramping of Sunspot. Instead, it looks like Browther feels more comfortable just straight up going for a tiebreaker and outpowering the Fleur. 
Yeah, he's not happy with his own debris, not thinking that through. I don't think he's very happy right now. It, it, it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good here. Even with a 13 drop, it's going to bring him to 26 in the middle lane. That means he would need six or less power in Los Diablos to have a shot, yet alone not thinking about Cyclops or Sunspot or anything else right now in the ruins. And two cards drop. Here's the High Evolutionary and a Nebula. That's going to allow Rolk to shoot up to 17. It's going to put the tiebreaker as four versus eight. And Browda holds on. Barely. Going into round number seven. Wow. Okay. The loss of energy right there being the difference maker and allowing it to move, allowing the game to move forward. Even with the potential misplay of the debris. Get a tinker or work job. And he goes immediately for the green goblin with no hesitation whatsoever. Fire it over to help counteract a bit of the sunspot. District X reappears again in this matchup. We had it in round number one as well. As Browther looks to plop down a Mobius for just some general defense. There we go. We're learning, learning the pattern right now. Cyclops now drops over into the right as they draw a ghost spider. And they look to capitalize with Titania because now they've got a 50-50 shot with Titania. Here's the leech to undo the benefits of the, or negatives, if you will, of Doc Ock. Ghost Spider brings the Mobius back over into the Tinkerer's workshop and Jeff has some flexibility. Ronin dr is drawn with what I believe would be four cards in the hand. Out. Ooh! And a big Cull Obsidian draw to supplement that Nebula in the left. Feels very good right now. I like the Jeff move here. I really like the Jeff move here in particular. Just for some simple floating, but that Ronin being conditional, holding the Nebula in place. You have a 13 point lead in the middle lane. You're feeling pretty secure about that. The Jeff movement allows the activation of Atlantis to give an extra reinforcement. You're sitting on a 13 Ronin currently, but it depends all obviously on how many cards or which cards end up being dropped. Hull of Sydney was the last card drop, so we're not looking at a blink situation right now as two more cards drop into Atlantis. That keeps Ronin restricted to a max ceiling currently of 14, which has to compete against Wave and Invisible Woman. It's a tiebreaker again, ladies and gentlemen. Cyclops still can't bring down the Jeff. And like that, we move on to round eight. Browdo holding on halfway through a comeback. Can he do it? Open up with some Nebula on Nebula action and get to a very precarious Elysium. Mojo World's the first location, and everybody can play cards cheaper due to the second location. To see White Widow drop in the right is a little bit of a surprise, knowing you have a four-cost cannonball in your hand, and you can bat cards out at your whim. Green Goblin Titania's definitely got to feel good. 
I'm liking the Titania call here onto Nowhere, so that way, if they do play into it like they did, it's still a secure 1 5. You don't have to think about it, don't have to worry about it. Here's the Cyclops, not affected by Nowhere, giving its first initial reductions. And Brow is going to go for a cheeky turn for Profex on Mojo World, trying to secure that location from being sniped too early here. Oh, it's a make or break call. There's only one card. And it's Leech. It's only a Leech. We have a moment. As Daredevil waits it out. So you're sitting on debris, which you could potentially play. It is just a straight up 2 3. So maybe it holds some value into nowhere. Maybe. Cannonball's a tough sell here, only because if for some reason. Oh, sorry, no, the ability's been removed. So if for some reason it were to be able to proc off, which second dinner, we would love that in this game. Finding a way to undo the ability of a card. With only a three power Jeff and a three power debris. We have Browda up against the ropes. Here's the Jeff. Here's the debris clogging the nowhere. And it's an Infinite with She Hulk to float on top of everything. For the first time, they make their full double team appearance, floating that boat and getting ready. Floor wipes the sweat off his brow as Browda. Unfortunately, is taken down by the French flower. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back with match number three. Stick around. We'll see you real soon. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen here. We're going into our third match here in the week two showcase. But if you're watching this on replay here on YouTube, this is that friendly reminder. We always have to do it. Go ahead, hit that like, subscribe, let your friends know because we have these competitions and we'd love to have you be a part of them. We'd love to showcase you here on the live stream. We'd love to showcase you here on YouTube, just like how we're about to showcase our next match. Let's swing over to Lufku versus Two Ts to kick us off here with a Ronin Cannonball deck. Oh, good luck. Oh, good luck. All right, we open up here with Crown City, which now is actually a very important location, considering it could be an easy win for Sanctum Sanctorum, potentially, depending on what each side is going to be playing. It's going to be an easy way to give that adjacent location, which not really too many cards are going to be able to be played into a potential play. Two T's has the armor to help restrict Murder World just a tad as Wave is actually gonna end up helping Two T's tremendously with this big dumb idiot's deck. The ability to ramp out that Red Hulk bright and early feels good. The Ronin feels good, but instead, Two T's opts to play on curve as Death Wave is played on the opposite side, not competing for the Crown City. In a shocking surprise, War Machine comes down on the board as Crown City now ends up being a little bit more precarious than we thought. Murder World's going to be an important play here to try to keep up as they're only sitting with six to work with, even though they have a two cost scar. So playing into Sanctum Sanctorum feels good, but... Can they hold down the Murder World? Because they have to play that Maximus then into Murder World, which will keep the Nebula in check, therefore keep Murder World in check. And instead, they leave the Sanctum Sanctorum alone and War Machines being played exclusively to keep up with the Infinite, who's going to switch that big piece over and allow a 31 to 28 lead in the Crown City, which by default gives Sanctum Sanctorum exactly what it needs. If they played that Infinite mid, they would have lost. So very good read right there. Very good read right there. 
Sokovia tosses Maximus from two T's and tosses Selene from Lufku, someone you don't see very often nowadays in Marvel Snap, so a very brave choice. But let's see how they plan on using it. We get a double float scenario as Death Domain appears into the third location. Cannonball becoming a little bit of a risk factor here due to that open location, but let's see what they pull on out. Gladiator pulls the worst possible target in Infinite as we get another wave here on three, potentially leading to another death. Man, Blob's gonna try to keep up tit for tat into Xandar. But we haven't seen the full potential of 2T's deck. Let's see what happens as Blink is gonna transform that wave into a death. And Blob now has to try to keep up with 34 power in that lane and it puts in 22 solo. So now Xandar is in competition status. Ooh, the cannonball on curve to hit that infinite out. The question is, where is it going to hit? As War Machine now drops here on turn five, and the cannonball smacks the infinite into the death domain, essentially securing that location all by itself. So it's a battle for Sokovia, which looks to be potentially overtaken via Echo and Ronin. Death's Domain gets stormed out. They leave Sokovia alone and Storm and Wave goes over the top and flooding. For some reason, we end up with a straight up tie. The math was mathing to math. And if Storm Wave was just played to the left, we would have been moving forward, but Lufku playing off big into that lane, I guess potentially worried about the armor that could drop down to make that a competitive location. That could have been a potential way to sneak over the top, worried about maybe a Shang-Chi. Interesting thought process on this big deck. So the game continues like nothing happened in round two. as Goose ends up being a potential sec lane securer with a green goblin removing the extra energy from two T's. Gladly puts the frowny face on there. That's an appropriate emoting, more than well earned and deserved. I'm on board for that, as they're gonna look to try to make a destruction play. A little risky here with the gladiator as we've seen. Here comes the gladiator pulling Storm to destroy the Triskelion, put us into the flooding. With a blade who tosses Selene, good sacrifice as Venom comes down second. Interesting, interesting. Because you could go power, right? You could, you have the crossbones, you can help secure the lane, but the question then becomes, can you secure the super flow? They're both competing for the flooding, not worried about the vault as much as Nebula comes in with Shuri into the vault. So we're looking pretty secure. As now, Lufku's got to try to keep up in two lanes as he reopens the flooded via War Machine. So small advantage in the vault. 
and enough that Lufku feels like he can play into that lane and not worry about it. Now we move into what do you do in the super flow? Do you go defensive with cannonball and hope that the drops land well? Do you go offensive with the big old blob and just try to outpower them? Do you go Lady Deathstrike for nine power secured, guaranteed? Lufku doesn't want to find out. Says, you know what? I feel bad. We had that weird tie for plays I don't understand. Here's a cube. I still have a nine to eight victory lead. Let's continue on. It's the last of the low stakes. Let's move through it. Sokovia tosses Rolk on opening hand. Oh, pop scenario for the Rolk and it's gone. As they now have to sacrifice cards and just try to keep up with Nebula by putting more into the hand, hoping the Mirror Dimension actually pulls down the Sokovia copy and discards something of importance from Lufku. It turns into the Sokovia, which tosses a crossbones and their war machine. Now they're pinpoint stuck with that Electro to only one card at a time. That feels good for Ronin in particular right now. As Blink dismisses that Electro and they Galactus! They pull the big Blink Galactus play! Huge play into Nidavellir for Lufku with the surprise round four Galactus. We haven't seen it yet here at the Snap Judgments League and they keep surprising us with these decks, ladies and gentlemen. Amazing play as Blob says, hold my Blob and drops a 24 power pull as Lufku skips looking to now probably have to drop the Infinite in hand. What's coming next though? Here's the Ronin. That's another 18. Here's an Infinite coupled with Selene. That's not gonna be enough and in a major amazing play from Lufku, he ends up in a deficit by five, having to lose his Galactus line. Man. And to think that was only for two cubes? What? What a sequence to now have to prepare for if you're two T's. Knowing that the Galactus is eminent, that completely changes the game plan looking for every possible way to manipulate. And man, Lufku got stuck twice. Got stuck with that Electro again. Maybe going to be able to get lucky with another blink out. But this alone changes the strategy of what you could do. Here's the crossbones because they have the one point advantage as green goblins can be fired over from their side. And now the Ronin competes with Nidavellir while we get a war machine providing some flexibility. So the 211 Scar has to feel good. Knowing that you can Scar and Cosmo or Scar and Gladiator. Give some protection to your to your line. This isn't feeling like a singleton play. This is definitely I have to play two cards play. And Lufku doesn't have enough. Even with seven energy to spread, knowing that that Ronin and Nidavellir is already in existence, it's a tough call to move forward with. While trying to steal two lanes, 
knowing how tall Two T's deck can go. Lufku's down to five cubes, and Two T's down to eight cubes at the moment with a Tarnax on point. The Two T's finally being able to take advantage of Echo, who's not being able to do too much right now as Black Knight appears while Celine gets flipped into a Kitty Pride, playing pretty nicely into Lufku's hand. Ooh. Sacrifices the Kitty Pride for the upgrade in this case to America Chavez. We get an Electro, though. And Gladiator has not had good luck today with some of these pulls, y'all. Gladiator comes on down. He has pulled Infinite. He has pulled Death. Not feeling good. As they go for the blink of the Electro into the sewer system, which pops off the Galactus. Pulls the Galactus ploy a second time via blink. As the Crossbones keeps the advantage for two T's who now has the flexibility of Ronin and a bunch of cards on the competition. Two drop out of the hand, which limits that Ronin now down to 10. They drop down their War Machine plus Nebula. It is not enough to keep the advantage. So now you've got to decide, is it about Shang-Chi or is it worth it to push Lufku all the way in? And 2T says, you haven't shown it yet. I am going for it. And Lufku doesn't have it. Being down 12 in the sewer system with one card apiece to win, it's not Enough! Lufku's down to three cubes against two T's, eight cubes right now as everybody has all of the opening energy. And two T's goes for a turn one blob on the right to compete and defends the pattern of Galactus on the right. Perfect sniping. The Project Pegasus gets ruined. Lufku not happy. And understandably for that reason. Huge advantage for two T's right now. I'm surprised we haven't seen a snap yet. As Storm looks to try to steal Project Pegasus solo with only an armor and echo to try to compete in the flooding. May have been worth the sacrifice to secure the blob in play, but instead opts to try to take out Lufku, who's playing a sage with Selene Storm and still doesn't have the advantage. Lufku now needing to compete in Baxter building to switch that extra energy as it goes for the unique costs. Yep, Lufku going for the Baxter building, trying to get the complete takeover. And for three cubes, this puts Lufku all the way in. They can play to the flooded and steal it. And they opt to not as Red Hulk drops into Nidavellir and the Infinaut drops into the Baxter building, swinging that priority in play for the Baxter over to Lufku's side, taking three cubes off of two T's, and that moves us into five to three, moving into round number eight.
War Machine doing work. Keeping Lufku alive. And don't worry, as we say every single week here on Snap Judgments League, y'all, location batching isn't real. Here we are with another Project Pegasus, and they're gonna go for the double blob in Kamartage. 30 plus incoming. 37 ends up being the success as Storm tries, but just is barely too late on getting that Kamartage to disappear as Tutis watches that Green Goblin fly, but be completely demuned by Blob. With an Elysium on top of it. And here comes the armor into the flooding, followed by Cosmo. as they wave out here on turn four. Rolk is an easy drop behind Cosmo for protection. The Selene doesn't proc, but the Galactus undoes it all again. Three times Galactus has successfully thwarted the game plan. When all else fails, just Galactus as War Machine comes down on five and priority stays in the hands of Tutis, who's only sitting on a Hope Summers and Lufku does not feel good right now. Sorry, Tutis does not feel good right now. It's not enough. Lufku taking advantage of that double blobbing on the left, knowing that 2T does not have a lot of cards, if any, in this deck, and just straight up galacticism and sweeps out two cubes. Lufku has brought it back to a full on tie, three to three. We are now in a best of three showdown between 2Ts and Lufku here at week two of the Snap Judgments League, ladies and gentlemen. Maximus plops a couple more cards into Lufku's hand. And the Dark Dimension. Maybe throwing some potential risk plays. As here we go, wave drops in to the big house. The protection of Blob under the Dark Dimension feels pretty good right now. Knowing that you're going to have a guaranteed full six after. But instead, opts for no more potential ramping of Red Hulk. As Blink, Wave, flips, and it's the Infinite. We almost saw it, folks. You thought it was coming too. You thought we were going to see a big house Galactus. But no, not yet. Not yet. Just wait. Here we go. Blink puts the War Machine down, allowing flexible plays across the board with a Nebula in Xandar as well. Ronin's going to put 15 power into that lane plus the bonus. So now seven and sorry, six energy, seven energy. There it is. Registering into two T's hand to try to compete into the Dark Dimension with the unknown waved out card of Dark Dimension. We're not looking at a Galactus cheese. There's no way Lufku goes for that in Dark Dimension now. Thinking that 13 is gonna be enough in Xandar, Tutis full commits to the Dark Dimension. Everything he's got. 
to say that he can take out Lufku by not touching Xandar, which is organically going to throw up to 19. And they play left and mid, ignoring Dark Dimension. The Sage goes up and it brings it over the top, y'all. Lufku comes back with the Sage over the top with the unique costs and takes down the two T's. Lower the Ronin, raise the Sage, fire off a Green Goblin, and just like that, Lufku comes on back in a wild back and forth, amazing match between the two. Look, both players the entire match had opportunities that in retrospect, they were looking at going, why did I do that? But that's why we do these games here in Marvel Snap. That's why we cast these games. We all as a, as a backseat driver, caster, viewer, follower, subscriber, whatever you are, we all saw what it could be, how you would have played it, I'd love to know down below. Let me know what you would have done differently, what you liked, what you didn't like, and is Sage also actually worth it? Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We've had some wild matches here halfway through today's presentation, but we're going to move directly on into another creator who we have not gotten a chance to feature yet. So welcome to the Snap Judgment League, Gregor, ladies and gentlemen. Gregor versus Havoc and Chaos. Let's see what happens. GG's, good luck, have fun. Let's see what they bring to the table right now. Gregor bringing in a Nocturne Nebula leader blink combination. Okay, so lots of leech blink potentially on the play line here. We see from the sides, poking out the bottom too as well, Dr. Doom and Sandman. So Sandman, semi, not ramp, kinda sorta. With a great Sandman variant, clearly enjoying everything Sandman has to bring. And taking advantage of a free move from Ant Maze is gonna bring the Nocturne 8 power as it slides it over. It doesn't hit Jotunheim, it opens up times two. We got the Nocturne again and it flips it again. The Monster Metropolis is no longer in existence and now we have a Nidavalier. The question is, who addresses Jotunheim? Does either player, do both players? And Gregor says, I'm not taking any chances. I want that undone. I'm not going to wait for you to maybe sort of kind of maybe a bit undo it. As we get a Mount Vesuvius and it's a mirror match at the moment. It's Oc turn into Leech. Guess who's not doing blink, ladies and gentlemen? Both players. So now we're looking at straight up power. Now it's straight up power moment. Knowing that you have fives and sixes in your hand, you might as well drop down both cards. Let the Nidavalier go up. You have the flexibility of the Nightcrawler as well here for Ant Maze as we get locked in via Mount Vesuvius. Nightcrawler drops into the Nidavalier, who's going to add on another five power. As Shuri is just there as a six power stack with no ability, with Nebula now going into Nidavalier and a Jubilee who's going to drop into Ant Maze and draw out of the deck a Jeff the Baby Land Shark. Nocturne now switches over, puts a monster island into play. So two monsters appearing into the island. And Gregor deciding if it's worth it to try and cheat out anything else. Will his two power Nightcrawler be enough to maintain a lead in Monster Island without too much sacrifice in Nidavalier. It's going to drop it down to 23, but we see the Jeff move over into Nidavalier. Clogs up the Nidavalier in total. Here comes a White Widow to outdo that blink. That keeps a tie in Ant Maze, and we end up in a full reduction via the Red Guardian who's been blinked out. It's an eight point to two point tiebreaker with crazy back and forths to start off, and Gregor now has to play from behind after losing two cubes here in round one. Castle Zemo, another location both players might be looking at as a potential need to flip location.
especially with a Bifrost coming in. We could see, again, double changings via Nocturnes. So it all depends on just the ordering of everything. Ooh, as we end with a pet mansion. So Nocturne not going to get the double Bifrost free movement. Unless if we see a Nocturne do a full rotation right now. We get a restricted Nightcrawler who's going to drop two power due to Red Guardian. With Blink in hand, we worry about the potential of Blink on Blink action, so we see Leech on... Nocturne! So no Leech on four for Havoc. With another move via Nocturne, the Bifrost now switches to Strange Academy with Nocturne in the center of it. Full Blink operation to flip the leech and the Strange Academy for the extra movement here at the end of turn five incoming. And remember, Havoc has not moved their Nocturne yet either. Instead, we see a blink that got leached, played down into Hotel Inferno, does the flip, gets the Sandman back on the board. Nocturne's gonna leave the Strange Academy, land now into Hotel Inferno, which switches to a throne room, doubling up the value of blink on the left. Trying to go over the top in the throne room definitely feels good by putting an eight power. The Jeff into the mid looks pretty good also. And we still have a movable Nocturne. Either way, Jeff moving, Nocturne moving, Pet Mansion something to keep an eye on. They slide the Jeff into the mid as Rolk enters into the Pet Mansion. Gladiator's going to come in and pull out White Widow who will die but leave the Widow's Kiss behind, still keep an advantage of 17 to seven in the throne room, which is a 10 point lead. And the tiebreaker goes 10 to seven, advantage Gregor this time. All of the tiebreakers. All of the tiebreakers. As we open up with a Nico Demon flip, potentially here into the miniaturized lab for Havoc and Chaos. Yep. Lands it on down. Here's the White Widow putting the negative four out there temporarily as Nico puts the demon into the miniaturized lab. Gamma Lab is intriguing, especially with a load of movable cards. BM Weir Island, plopping it on down, and instead they go for the sacrificial Jeff, as Nebula and Jeff both take the plunge into the Gamma Lab, going up to 12 power apiece, as Rolk says, wait a minute, I can do something fun too. Leech on four, no blink in hand, but Sandman leader does feel good nevertheless. Unless if you get green fisted by Leech also. So Nocturne has ramp potential and they semi top deck the Doctor Doom, which gives nice spread power and the, mo the move ability of Nocturne. Here comes the Jubilee into the Gamma Lab, dropping on down a Jeff out of the deck again. We've seen that already happen today. As the 17 power Rulk sits in the hand. Now trying to play around both. 
That loads up the miniaturized lab that'll remove the Widow's Kiss and put the Nocturne in play with the Doom Bot. So you're gonna have a six, four, five, a 15 point swing. That's gonna put 20 in the miniaturized lab for an easy win in the mid as they go against an opposing Dr. Doom. Sanctuary 2 is not gonna be of anything of importance, anything of importance for either player as the Doom Bot on the right is gonna be one short, but the Dr. Doom on the left has enough girth to it and will take down 26-23 in Muir Island. That moves us on with a small advantage. Gregor with eight, Havoc and Chaos now down to six. All right, just a nebula to open us up and a bar sinister. Bar sinister. If we see a snap right now, this could be an immediate retreat, but no, we don't get a snap. No uh, White Widow being dropped down yet. Probably not in the hand as we have nebula on nebula action in the right with a collapsed mine to compete with. While it is tempting to drop down that Nocturne on three, both players op, opt for the rock destruction, put the rubble behind them, and let the Rolk grow. Leech into the collapsed mine, keeping Nebula in check. I wouldn't be surprised to see a mirror play right here. We don't see a mirror. We see two cards drop on Havoc's side as they get Leech. Red Guardian reduces down the Leech, missing the Nebula, as Nico has the copy card spell into Grand Central. Sandman into Grand Central also allows for a little bit of uncertainty. Hoping that Jeff doesn't get pulled as we get our bar sinister play and it's claw, 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 claw. All of the claws to compete the bar sinister. Now they're sitting on that other claw, which does mean that they can ramp up to as high as 24 power in bar sinister. Sandman comes down who pulls a Shuri and into Grand Central and there's the fifth claw. Looking for at least seven power into Bar Sinister to go over the top of it. There's no way that Gregor's going to be able to keep up. Not with one card at a time. Not going to be worth it. Here we go. We're now in high stakes. Seven to six right now. Small advantage Gregor. Trying to deal with the Dream Dimension. This is a perfect example to showcase exactly what 5149 is. I'm going to reference back to my colleague Lambi series who talks very heavily about having an advantage in these heads up games. Right now, both players have been playing exactly the same when it comes to Nebula. Nebula is being favored over into the right hand side. The advantage would be to actually play Nebula into a different lane, knowing that you have four opportunities to counteract your opponent's Nebula, but neither player has been able to take advantage of that. We both know they played Nebula. They both like to play it on the right hand side. The second someone does not draw a Nebula, they should be preparing to load and help keep the Nebula in check that way. Instead, both players are taking advantage of trying to counteract each other, and this type of knowledge is what Lamy refers to as a 51-49 situation that could give you an extra piece of advantage against your opponent. Look for these types of opportunities if you are a competitive Marvel Snap player, because that is a very key piece to moving forward in these competitions. As Gladiator drops into New York and drops out a Nocturne and destroys it very quickly, very, very quickly. Hmm. 
and a Jeff to drop with three cards in their hand that they can't play on turn five due to the dream dimension. So hoping for something decent here as all three get leeched. Rolk goes up to 17 and Grand Central really only has its own leech potentially to go down in it. Looking to spread the uncertainty. Gregor only moves Nightcrawler and Jeff now. Giving the small advantage in the Dream Dimension as New York gets its own representative. It's a Jubilee who adds to the party a Jeff. Jubilee really liking Jeff the last couple of games as Blink, who was blinked, sorry, was leeched, excuse me, is dropped. Gregor looking at all of the math movements, the highest potential combination would be adding in eight power into New York via slides, unless if they dropped in an Ant-Man. Havoc knows that he doesn't have a lot of power on the board, especially in the Dream Dimension. Good runaway, good runaway, good runaway. Gregor keeping the lead seven to four in round number six. as Gregor changes his screens in the middle of the stream to completely throw us off. Gregor giving us JJ Rolk vibes. Now, as we look to play Medusa into Necrotia and keep a three point advantage. Medusa not getting too much play so far in this deck. As we get a snap for four cubes, Gregor says it's not worth it. He doesn't like his opening hand. He, if he was sitting on Blink, I could think that this would play forward nicely, but without Blink in hand, it's hard to accept that one. Continues on, let's go to round seven, still with the five to four lead favoring Gregor. Jotunheim pops in. Havoc and Chaos can get a duplicate card and opts for a duplicate Nebula. Not turn on the play. as Red Guardian removes our own Nebula from Gregor's side. Leaving that Nebula at a negative one play, looking for a little bit of a draw here, but either way, leeching prior to Asgard still feels good when each player's played one card per turn. That means four cards are gonna end up potentially at max with the leech. Yep, four cards get leeched at max over on, on the side of Havoc and Chaos as Jubilee pops into Hala and pulls out Blink, who rotates out the Red Guardian and swaps it for a Red Hulk. Red Guardian back in the deck now could have been repulled via Asgard. As a simple Sandman Doctor Doom combo could be enough to take over Hala and Jotunheim, depending on where Havoc and Chaos play here on turn five. They play right, keeping that Nebula in check. That's another five power differential as Jeff goes into Hala. Here comes your Sandman. And now with the movability of Nocturne, plus a Doctor Doom, plus a leader, it's a tough call, but Oh, I don't like this play whatsoever. You don't have the lead in two lanes. Playing leader is incredibly risky, banking on a Jeff move. That puts a lead in two lanes.
and we're looking at sniping Jotunheim with a winning four power. It looks like Claw is going to feed eight into Jotunheim. Nocturne flips over the hub, which does nothing here on turn six, and Dr. Doom is going to be enough on the left, but not enough in the mid via the effects of Jotunheim. Claw coming in big to secure a couple more cubes and bring Gregor down to his final cube. It's Havoc and Chaos now with their first lead of the match, moving forward with a four to one lead going into round number eight. Tinkerer's Workshop. One location too early, so we can't get a turn three leech, but sitting on leech into blink definitely has to feel good. Here comes your Nocturne, looking to maybe hit that Mindscape, and now you just end up with a whole game of chicken. Looking to fire off that leech into Castle Zemo for two power does not feel like a bad idea considering that if you blink that leech back, it'll reappear on your side of the battlefield. Mindscape has officially been discarded as they fire over their own nebula via Castle Zemo. Little bit of a shocking play. And instead they go for the Muir Island stack. Here's a leech. Let me get rid of that for you. Here's a Jubilee. Let me pull this out for you. She pulls onto the battlefield a claw who does nothing in the right hand location, helping to control the claw. Now we're sitting on a blinking leech. As Blink turns leech into Sandman on the restriction. And leech on five doesn't feel good. What looked like a great play line to win, now via is very restricted. You have a three lane lead. So even though it's a singular doom, you've got to defend. Dr. Doom, even in a top deck scenario, does not win versus a blinked doom in the mid. So I like this play. This is for Gregor's last cube. We get two to drop on Havoc and Chaos. It's a Nico Minoru and Jeff. Nico's got four, but doesn't have enough. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to round number nine. Round number nine of Gregor versus Havoc and Chaos. Down to the wire. Final cubes for both players. Good luck. Here we go. Who pulls Leech? with once again Jotunheim reappearing for our players, this time on the left. Nebula on the right again. As now Nebula appears in the hand. And Gregor with a unique opportunity to take advantage of Nebula in Jotunheim, which isn't very commonly pulled especially now being in a deficit via the Widow's Kiss. Ooh, opting for the Nebula to try and be sneaky in the danger room as Nico puts on the movement play for Jeff, safely placing him in the danger room into a less dangerous situation. With the leech in hand and the blink and the doom, this turn might depict the entire match all by itself. Both players play one card. One plays the Jubilee, which is able to pull out 
the Nocturne. One player plays the Leech to remove everything of value from the hand. And now... They have to look at how to win the other locations. Small advantage for Havoc and Chaos at the moment with the two laners as Claw drops into Jotunheim, beefing up that Hell's Kitchen. Leech is going to get blinked out into Leader, who will now take a Claw of their own and put it into Hell's Kitchen. Huge pull for Blink to bring that Claw onto their own side of the battlefield. Now with a Doctor Doom on top of it, that's going to be 10 power into the Hell's Kitchen. It will fill up the Widow's Kiss on the left, not be enough for the right, but you've got to compete for it. Huge leech blink leader pull as dot as Nocturne and Jeff both slide into Jotunheim. That's going to flip the negativity of Jotunheim into the white hot room for both players being pretty down to nothing. Here's the Doctor Doom now with a 10 to 9 lead and a 20 to 19 lead in the left in the mid and barely by the skin of his teeth. Ladies and gentlemen, Gregor holds on for dear life against Havoc and chaos the leech into blink synergy is so strong ladies and gentlemen and with an mvp move like finding the leader in the deck it's hard to keep up with that rng on the favor of gregor this side how do you feel about leech and blink kind of scared to ask that though all right we're back welcome back everybody we have match number five right ahead of us. Now, I don't know if their name is Billy, but I'm going to assume that's the case. Why? Because it's the kid. It's the kid versus dummy. Good luck. Have fun. Let's see what they're both bringing to the table as we open up with Forge, Carnage, Taskmaster in the hand and a Krakoa to start. Phoenix Force... I think we have a rough idea of where we're going with this. Here we go. Sinister London also as well with the demon spell for Nico Minoru. Hmm. While tempting, I think the forge is the safest play incoming here, looking for some extra pieces to be revived via the Sinister London. Putting the Forge out there, get the two extra power, and the Colleen Wing from Dummy speaks with that Wolverine very heavily to a nice discard deck. It could be straight up classic discard versus Phoenix Force. We have an Isle of Silence with a double move piece from Nico as a potential play, but now with Venom on the board and no big rampers, this is a tough call to decide where the power is going to come from as the kid ends up going for it looks like debating on a full float. Not happy with any of the options. Opsa just float as we get two discards of that apocalypse who shoots from 6 to 10 and 10 to 14 into the hand. Lady Sif rocking that plus four power from the Krakoa bo uh, boost as now Nico ends up with the 2x reinforcement as well. Tough call here. Because on the one end, you can end up with the 8 power Nico. And on the other end, you can end up with a 6 power Deadpool into your hand. Yet alone multiple. They take the Venom line. As Blade goes for the discard, discards out, now bringing Apoc to 18. Dokken puts the Muramasa shard into their hand. By playing the Dokken second after the Blade, it speaks pretty heavily that we're going to see Apoc just drop in solo as is on Sinister London. As the two Venoms appear nine and nine, and it doesn't feel very good. I mean, Phoenix Force could turn into Nico. 
as the only destroyed card here for turn five. Here's the Human Torch down just for some points. The Phoenix Force comes back, turns into the Nico now, who goes now to nine power, puts a second one on the board. Both are going to be able to move because there's the 18. Now that on reveals as it waits for the extra plus two power. Dummy confused as all hell about what this play combination looks at. But the kid clearly saw the light. Big, big stats. Big stats here coming out of Nico Minoru with this Phoenix Force. Now the double drac does pose a bit of an issue because it will go left to right. So you have to compete a little heavier on the right because that'll be a stronger Dracula. Here comes the Taskmaster. Taskmaster copies the Nico Minoru. That other Nico goes to 36 and the two Taskmasters now appear. Here's a Deadpool as Modok is going to shoot out those even further. Here comes discard number one. Muramasa Shard's gonna double up on that dock, and the strong guy's gonna do next to nothing. Here comes another discard of it. That's gonna go to 26. That's gonna bring the mid up to a total of now 30, which will just go over the top in both lanes. One by one, taking that power. Both players had great play lines to make that work, but that 36 power, Nika Minoru hanging out on the left needed that Dracula to copy from Sinister London and move to the to the right, I should say. Excuse me. Needed to move to the right as Dummy takes off two cubes off of the kid. And we just get a simple, uh, simple Nico. We got the double up Nico again, looking to play it on down the Wakandan embassy. Excuse me, uh, the Wakanda playing down into the middle lane could be a little distracting. But at least you got a 2-5 multiple man in hand now from this too. over the multiple man as dummy already knows what they're playing on down on turn three here all of the combos and moves debating about which move is going to be more valuable is it going to be the hulk buster add on to the multiple man and then drag it over or destroy it and hope that you top deck the phoenix force that go that ends up being the direction they look to go they're really banking on phoenix force in this moment as now they could ramp a little bit of extra power via the Human Torch. Human Torch into Hulk Buster into Ghost Spider gives some nice power for the Baxter building, but not enough for them to say it's worth risking on right now. They hit Deadpool. And now they really need to start trying to catch up on some of this power. They opt to clog up Krakoa. There's your Human Torch getting Hulkbustered, going to 5 power. That's going to get Ghost Spidered and double up to 10, with the Deadpool also clogging the, clogging the Krakoa lane for no contestion at the moment. Here's your Deadpool, which is now going to keep up against the Dokken, who will be able to shoot up to 8. Put on the extra 4 power onto the top deck, as the Blade now gets rid of the Muramasa Shard. 
only sitting on a forge in Doctor Strange doesn't feel very good for the Baxter building as there's not too much movement that helps secure that location on the left and the mid. Or the mid, I should say, in this case. They take the escape. Take the escape. The kid not fearing any potential leeches and bringing in exactly and bringing in a Phoenix Force deck in today's meta. As they end up with a destroyer in hand via the Great Portal. Deadpool. And multiple man providing uncertainty, depending on the destroy via carnage. Ooh, got a bar sinister too. Now we contemplate even that Hulkbuster potentially. Hulkbuster into into bar sinister by itself is a great stable big singleton card. As they take the destroy on, put the Deadpool back in the hand, the blade's gonna put Wolverine onto the battlefield, ramping up the Morbius and getting Nita Valir to shoot up to 17. Feeling good about all the movements they have to work with. At just a forge into Deadpool, maybe following that with the Taskmaster could be the play as they go for docking on four again to play into that Morbius line. And they sit on a crazy play now of Hulkbuster Venom Taskmaster if they see it. Because that Hulkbuster will absorb into nothing. All the Hulkbusters would come on out. And then they could Taskmaster that thing all by itself. Do they see the light? They do. They do. The kid sees lots of Hulkbusters, lots of Venoms. Here comes a Doc Ock, who's gonna pull out the Taskmaster and the Destroyer! Oh, nose! On the one end, this is really bad. Really, really bad. But on the other end, watch the final score of this Bar Sinister. Hulkbuster is going to absorb into the Destroyer, which now is going to get Venomed. After that Destroyer destroys everything because it copies the Hulkbuster. Now Venom eats up the Destroyer to 22, which is going to compile that lane to a whopping 88 when all is said and done while sitting on a 1-8 and a 2-3 in their hand. You've got a weak mid and a scalable left. Oh, Strange is a very cheeky play. Very cheeky play. And they're going to try to go for the tie. He goes for the retreat and doesn't try to take down Nidavalier. Even with that crazy 88 powered Venom, doesn't have enough. The kid has to back away from Dummy. Oh, you hurt to see it.
It's a this is a tough, tough matchup for the kid as there's so much scale late game scalable power. Neither player playing a deck that fears leech. And the kid looking to try to capitalize on filling up the white hot room. Putting, being able to put down that Hulkbuster on turn four opens up some nice lines later on in the match. No destroy yet via Phoenix Force and giving us a wonderful light show as they decide what the hell they're going to do, but they just go with the Hulkbuster to absorb into something of value. That'll give lots of extra energy to work with on five and six. Gotta be feeling good. It hits the Deadpool, so man, a Ghost Spider, which could have been fantastic, unfortunately does not have the legs that it's gonna end up needing. As now Nico comes in with the double up and nothing destroyed and a Phoenix Force in the hand here for turn five. Not feeling lovely and good. Awful draws for the kid. But trying to make it work, if they can get that Nico to survive in the danger room, there's a small chance as Blade's gonna discard the Apocalypse. So Morbius gonna be a guaranteed six at minimum here. They need Nico to survive, it doesn't. And Phoenix Force is gonna bring back the Nico to move it. What a combo, as that 2x from Nico is going to go up to 14 times 2, because it's the last card played and it reactivates itself. A 28 power Nico flying across the board. I have never seen that playline combo, but wow, was that an incredible move. Nico recognizing all of its potential lines and what I thought was gonna be needing to survive was actually the opposite. It needed to actually die. Cause now the Taskmaster comes on down, copies that 28 power and allows a 39 to 32 play up. Wolverine's gonna be discarded. It's gonna land over in the left, showing some contention for the white hot room as the, the strong guy shoots up. That's gonna give us an 18 power when all is said and done, gonna be ramping up to 22 power for the white hot room. It's not gonna be enough, but it's a damn good showing from the kid understanding the full mechanics of how that Phoenix Force and Nico Minoru end up needing to be played. That was unbelievable from the kid. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> we get an early snap here of seeing Nico with the double destroy into Deadpool, which has two power already added onto it from Wakandan Embassy. And a holla for destruction all by itself, so not even needing destroy cards. We get Nico to destroy the Deadpool, get a couple of draws. And now the Deadpool can even drop into Hala if Hala's being contesting. Contested, excuse me. As Wolverine shoots to four and drops into the right. Kid hoping that hoping it would have dropped into Hala. Brings a black vortex to play. Very scary. Very, very scary moment here with the Black Vortex. Hoping for a Destroyer's probably best case scenario overall long term for the kid. They're gonna go for the Forge. Forge becomes Thanos for a 10 safe power. The Deadpool shoots up to eight. It will get destroyed all by itself now at the end of turn four if they leave it alone.
in a very confusing play. They're going to opt to kill both the Deadpool and Multiple Man, which will get the Carnage only to six. Now, the Carnage will also go away via the Hala Destruction. So Carnage is now eligible to be revived via Phoenix Force as well. So a two out of three shot. And they're just straight up opting to ignore the Phoenix Force. Looking at a potential Taskmaster play? No, not with the Human Torch going second. Deadpool into Venom. As they opt for 29 versus 32. That's your Taskmaster play with a three point differential advantage. Not needing to worry. Understanding the three points. I thought it was shorter. Beautiful. Two 32s can drop on this. It's going to be for six cubes if, if Dummy pushes forward. This is for everything the kid has. That's a nice 17 point lead in the right. And they play it down. Here you go. There's your 32 power Deadpool. Taskmaster copies it, brings him up to 32. The Modoc is going to discard a bunch, but it's not going to be enough as the Proxima Midnight goes into the Black Vortex. And the kid holds on, knocking six cubes off of Dummy. Wow. The kid here playing chess while your caster, ladies and gentlemen, is still playing a King Me checkers and pulls incredible amounts of power out of this Phoenix Force deck. This is a huge, huge, huge lesson in Phoenix Force and all of the things that it can potentially do. Take notes, bring them home, study them. Bring it here next week here on the Snap Judgments League. Let's see if you can pass the test like the kid is doing so far. Here we go. We open up with the forge. Into a Wakanda, which doesn't feel too good as a second location. Kind of throws off a little bit of the rhythm they were hoping to gain. Now they debate about which line is going to be more valuable to them. The Deadpool into Wakanda definitely is not that line. They look at the double destruction play for every potential option to be available to them. He's doing the math, saying I can do it. Just give me a second. I need a minute here. and a kill. Instead of taking on the nine via the Venom, they opt to float in energy and just use the Carnage, which is going to permit for a six. As we get the Muramasa Shard discarded via Blade and Morbius starts his ascent into double digits. Carnage being Ghost Spidered would put a good amount into that lane, but I don't know if it would be enough to compete. Instead, we just go for continually looking to ramp in the Superflow, get as much power over there as they can. There goes your other six of Deadpool. Venom eats it all, puts the 112 Deadpool back into the hand and allows for Venom to remain there as a 315 into the Superflow. The kill is officially a sacrificed location as they now sit on Ghost Spider, Human Torch, Deadpool. 
looking at all potential plays. So the question becomes, do you go with Taskmaster now on the Venom and play your other big pieces, uh, other small pieces out later, or do you contest the Deadpool Taskmaster on turn six? And that opts to be the line they're looking at right now. Maybe drag the Venom over and go very tall in Wakanda by putting down the Deadpool now. Keep up on top of the docking, because remember, Dummy's also playing with one extra energy. They're playing with six on this turn. As Colleen Wing tosses the Proxima Midnight into the Superflow for some early easy power, putting 20 as a contest. That 20 power is huge right now as Deadpool flips, knowing that Taskmaster can only shoot up to 12. This looks like it's gonna be in favor of Dummy when all is said and done. Even though Doctor Strange could bring back over the Venom, it's probably not gonna be enough. They're gonna take the chance and move the Venom out via Doctor Strange, and here we go. Strong Guy gets his buff. Here comes the Lady Sif, discarding the Apocalypse. That's gonna ramp up the Morbius, which is already a one lane. Here's the Taskmaster copying the Deadpool. On to the left, Doctor Strange taking advantage of the Superflow extra energy, brings over the Venom. That's gonna shoot it up to 30 in the left, and the Dracula takes on another 14 power via the Apocalypse, and barely holds on right there. That is a amazing lesson of both players understanding their decks, watching the placement of that Proxima Midnight, the ramping of the strong guy, and thinking, how can I use seven energy to my best advantage from the kid? These are experts in their decks, ladies and gentlemen. This is an absolute pleasure to watch and cast. Wow. You think you know. Amazing. as Blade gets us an early, first off, discard of the APOC. And now a Vormir gives a free destruction, so you gotta choose, what do you want more? Deadpool, Human Torch, or Multiple Man? You're sitting on Phoenix Force already in your deck. And you have undestroyable cards potentially entering your deck via the Vibranium Mines. I like the slide potential here on capitalizing on the multiple man to not have to activate too many Vibranium Mines Vibraniums. Dummy has a full skip, who's not happy about it. As we look to a Pretty tough scenario here, looking at what do you do on three? Do you put in another card to disrupt, like a Deadpool, and then take your 50-50? You do. You take the 50-50 on it. You show the indecision to the opponent. Carnage is going to destroy the Deadpool. Oh, correction, I apologize, because Deadpool goes back into the hand. It's not a 50-50. Phoenix Force still has a guaranteed uh, play. It's gonna be a guaranteed, if they drop it now, it'll still definitely be there because it respawns the Deadpool into the hand, not put a copy into the hand. As Dummy puts Dracula over into the Vibranium Mines, here come all of the multiple men for the very first time, making it all the way to round seven before we start seeing the multiplicities of the multiple men. Ooh, I see a great play line here with that Nico Minoru and Hulkbuster getting extra multiple men potentially to enter the battlefield. Order is so important here because if they play exactly as they did, the multiple man will stay there 
Hulkbuster will attach and then Multiple Man will return afterwards, now adding 11 into the middle lane instead of adding 8 back into it. This is a huge, huge play here for the kid. As Dummy destroys that Wolverine into Vormir, opening it up and puts a Vibranium on top afterwards, so giving that two power over to the Wolverine. Here comes the Nika Minoru, watching the perfect play line here. This is what you hope for as a multiple man player. You get that 211 back to your hand, and it puts that other 211 down into Vormir. Order, order, order in the court. We've got 11s coming all over the place here as multiple man and multiple man and multiple man make a grand appearance here. Looking to not have to compete against Vormir. The kid is just stacking right. Sorry, not looking to compete against Dracula. They're looking to just stack only mid and right with the Shadowland. Moves like Multiple Man. Here they go. Multiple Man brings a copy back over into Vormir number one. Here comes Multiple Man revealing on number two. The third Multiple Man, which is technically the second one, is now going from the middle lane over into the left-hand lane, putting that 11 back over in there, putting currently 26, which gets the extra four from the Vibranium, up to a total of 30. And now you're looking at 50. 15, 30, and 22 at the current moment. That's going to be an easy win for the Dracula lane on the left, but as Proxima Midnight drops and sees the weakness of Dracula, it's going to be too much over in the left, and the kid is able to knock out Dummy in a wild back and forth. Two absolute experts of their deck piloting back and forth and back and forth and back. What a wild match to watch, Cast. What did you think about this version of Deadpool Phoenix Force? Because y'all, that was incredible to watch. Oh. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Here we go. We're going into match number six. This will be today's final match here for week two's presentation of the Snap Judgment League. If you like the tournament content, please let us know who do you want to see in these tournaments? Who do you want casted in Snap Judgments League? And who was your favorite match today and why? Let's take a look and see if maybe this match brings it all home. We're going to be facing off right here, right now. Joining us is No Big Deal versus Gatos. Let's see what both players bring to the table today as No Big Deal starts us off with what would have been a Jeff. Iceman, Red Hulk, and Claw, and Gatos has a discarded uh, piece as well. Now, that Elsa disappearing, I mean, it could probably lead into a, maybe a bounce style deck. Let's see what the raft does. And there he is. There he is, ladies and gentlemen. He's mean, he's green, and man, does he need a beanie. It's Leech. White Widow, Claw, Iceman, straight up interference, straight up a nuisance. But does Gatos have the Loki deck to keep up with it? Seeing Snow Guard pretty much confirms it for me that this is going to be the straight up top 12 style Loki deck. But is no big deal able to navigate around it via Leech? No blink in hand. No problem. Especially with Jubilee also in hand, this actually feels very strong right now for no big deal. Going into turn number four, it's advantage no big deal, which needs to be the consistent pattern if he's gonna keep up with Loki. Thought it right, said it backwards. <laughs> the other way around is both players are sweating and they retreat. No big deal, takes away a cube, continues on, let's go to round two. Thought it right, said it backwards. 
Here, w would you like a squirrel? Because everyone's getting one. Start with the Kitty Pride in Central Park first. Next is Vibranium Mines. Tough call with the Central Park on how to navigate everything, but if that Elsa Bloodstone's in hand, the Kitty Pride is very happy to see Central Park as Muir Island ends up being our third location, favoring that Kitty Pride definitely. So I like the call here to go ahead and storm it, discard the idea of it being anything of value, reduce it down to diddly squat. As we get a snap from Gatos, no big deal is a little stressed, but going to move forward with it. And there's the storm. Storm disappears, gives a big old piece of rain onto that Muir Island, and Angela, not happy. Gatos, definitely not happy right now. The Red Guardian would hit the squirrel, and Jubilee, while tempting, does restrict then the top end power of Doctor Doom. You're also never sure what Jubilee is going to pull. Jubilee doing the pull now is safe given the blink and the timing and the ordering of that Jubilee Vibranium Mines combo. It's going to pull the leech first. Remove everything out of Gatos' hand. Here's the Elsa giving a little bit of extra support to that Kitty Pride and getting the ramp onto Angela up to a total of six. That Kitty Pride bounces back into the hand and leaves a pretty confident 10 behind. Meanwhile, the Doctor Doom plus Jeff combo could add eight into the flooded. Looking at the blink with that Jubilee, we have Red Hulk in hand and Doctor Doom in hand. It's only round two, so we haven't seen everything at this moment. Let's see what they flip out. There's the claw. Claw all by itself keeps the flooded interesting as Rogue puts a scare into the heart of no big deal and this caster. Rogue being leeched was MVP worthy to maintain that claw. Now, if they have their own Jeff, which in this deck is very likely, Angela goes up two. The Jeff gets two from Elsa Bloodstone. So we see a seven power swing into the flooded. Here, via Doom and moving the Jeff, you go ahead and you keep an eight power on top of it at the sacrifice of your left. Gatos knows this as well, says, well done. Here's a couple of cubes. We move to round three. All right. Simple Kitty Pride. Now, Deep Space, very interesting here. If we end up seeing a Doctor Doom draw, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a Blink play via Deep Space. It's a little risky to do the blinking in Deep Space. To, you know, swap that. But now they're going to have to protect their nebula. They've got to storm in Oscorp Tower. We get a snap. No big deals. Reacting like it's a big deal. A little bit of a hasty snap, in my opinion, from Gatos. 
possibly not remembering the fact that there is a storm in No Big Deal's deck to keep that nebula scaling for several turns. As we get a black vortex in the mid. Gatos has priority too, so Red Guardian could have a potential play here. for just the simple flip of the 3-5 with Red Guardian. But Iceman's going to drop down first, interfere, flip to a different one, uh, sorry, flip to a, a random six cost. Then Red Guardian's be like, I got this. Flooding definitely showing some challenges here as Kitty Pride gets tossed into the vortex and pops out an Infinaut! Pops out an Infinaut! What an exchange! As Red Guardian does its 3-5 and Iceman stays on the board! What a play from Gatos! Not only getting a great flip from the Black Vortex, but disabling the Black Vortex from the likes of No Big Deal. We see Quinjet Loki drop down into the flooding. As Blink flips that Red Guardian into a Rulk. Trying to show a little bit of threat in the Black Vortex. as he decides if five power is gonna be enough. Five power into deep space. If Gatos floats any energy, the Rulk goes up and we end up in a tie in the mid. It, it'd be a seven, they'd need 12 power. Over five energy at least into deep space. No big deal doesn't think that is unlikely. We continue on. Loki with a, exactly with a bunch of cheap cards coming in. Winjet reduced. Loki reduced. Even if it's just two cards. The Doctor Doom they could have gotten. The Rolk they could have gotten. That Loki had a lot of targets and then a double reduction on top of it. I like the call here to say retreat later. Let the enemy sweat. We go from there. No big deal. And Gatos holding tight to their cube equity as Gatos keeps a lead eight to seven. No big deal. The miniaturized lab. Can't get scammed out. Unless if we get a Hawk early. And a Project Pegasus now makes the miniaturized lab much more appealing than it did before. Tough decision on how to use seven energy, but instead. They end up just sitting. Miniaturized lab is going to stay open again. One more turn. There's a Koa. MBD holding Gatos back by storming on the Krakoa first. Even while Hawk. Safest time to do it, so if you're going to disable it. I mean, now is the perfect time, so interesting thought process for NBD.
and the bear <laughs> goes to activate energy and doesn't register the energy because of the disabling via the snow guard hawk. If they played the snow bear now, the five energy would reactivate for turn six, for turn five. Energy ramp to not go the direction that I think Gothos may have been looking for. Hi, Jeff. Jubilee has absolutely targeted Jeff all day long here. All day long. Valentina is putting a six cost card into the into the deck. Jubilee and Jeff are definitely friends and they've been calling each other in every deck. As Red Guardian is gonna, interest, uh, this is a very interesting call here. Assuming that Project Pegasus is gonna get filled up, they go ahead and White Widow, followed by the Red Guardian. So instead of allowing that zero to maybe come on because they could be a negative four, they opt to play it safe, get the power differential by playing it second, and then just take your hits as they come. Now you've got a floating Jeff. Your opponent has seven energy. You have a floating Jeff. This is a tough final turn here for both players. Looking at, is there movement of Jeff? What lane is being sacrificed? Who gets extra energy where? Where does the power have to pop up? Claw in the mid puts 16 into the flooded. It's, it's mainly risky in the mid. You're assuming that Jeff is going to move out. Otherwise, you'd be dead tied. And we're back to tiebreaker scenarios again. for the full sacrifice and super reinforces the mid as Gatos has retreated and it's just seven to seven. It's high stakes, y'all. Oof. Murder World doesn't feel good. Neither player too happy about it as Snow Guard makes an early appearance. And we get Weird World. Both players swap the draws. As we open with Jeff. Just not there, Jeff. It's a Jeff, but not there, Jeff. All right, Valentina. Show Gato something good. It's been reduced. It's been cost efficient. Hey, look, they're playing a Shang-Chi. As they have their Jeff and they disable their Snow Guard. Little tight here, but Weird World's gonna get a Jubilee Contestion. Jubilee contests and pulls down a Claw, which is a perfect feed. Assuming that that Claw does not slide, we get the Agatha to slide over from the Valentina draw. Agatha playing perfect there on turn four and puts herself into the Great Web. Wow.
They're gonna nix the Agatha entirely. Oh man, NBD is really tough here. Really, really tough here. We see a snap for a full push. And they move forward with it. It's going to be at least four cubes as Shang-Chi removes that Agatha. Here comes a Loki. There's the Kitty Pride. Here comes an Iceman. And Iceman takes the slide. So. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. We have a movable Jeff. We have an indispensable Dr. Doom. We have Gatos pushed in for all seven cubes. Do they stay? Decides to opt for the Jeff into the mid. Let's see if that's going to pay off for them. No big deal. And Gatos both pushed in for seven cubes. Are they going for it? It's a weird world, Loki. They do! Here we go! Dr. Doom drops on down. Only five in there. The Claw's gonna add eight over into the weird world. The Jeff with the movement's gonna put 13 in the total mid. The Widow's Kiss reduces down your left-hand side. There's your Jeff giving it over the top into the weird world. And just like that, Gatos comes over the top and takes down no big deal. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what wraps us up here for week number two for season number two here at the snap judgments league for those who do not know my name is guest also known as it's guest gaming you can come join me here live on twitch for these presentations and i look forward to seeing you all next time thank you so much everyone enjoy the rest of your day